<laughs> Gorsh, would you look at that? Today's a very special episode of the podcast. Today, in episode 120 of the podcast, I got the chance to talk to one of my favorite people. If you love your veggies and want more to know, then I've got for you a spectacular show. We be giving you back since the lyrical arrives and bringing in guests by the light of the time. If you search for your hairbrush and love cheeseburgers too, then I'm happy to say we've, we've got, got a, a show, show for, for you. you. Welcome back to the podcast. We have a very fun episode planned today. I'm here with Phil Vischer, creator of Veggie Tales, What's in the Bible, the Mr. Phil Show, host of the Holy Post podcast, author of Me, Myself, and Bob, founder of Big Idea Productions, Jellyfish Labs, father, husband, all around good guy. That that sums up some of it, right? That's about it. I don't <laughs> think there's anything else. How are you doing today? I'm okay. I'm okay. Just recorded our own podcast, so I'm a little winded, but I just ate a donut to get my energy back up, which well, is... That'll, that'll do it. Yeah, so I'm good for about a half an hour until I have a sugar crash, and then I'll be under my desk. <laughs> what type of donut you got? It was glazed, just glazed. Nothing wrong with that. Best type, you know? Gas station glazed donut. Best donuts in the world. Well, you've got all these people trying to overcomplicate donuts, you know? like I know. You know I don't need... Bacon. I don't need bacon on my donut. It's too much. Too much. That's Just too a much. classic glazed donut. Can't go wrong with that. Exactly. Have we got a show for you. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. I've dreamed of talking to you in real time since basically forever. It's really amazing for me. Um, so we'll jump right into the questions. I wanted to start with yeah. the, the mission first because I feel like everything you do, I mean, you're, you're creative with your writing and your voiceover, mm -hmm. but I feel like the main focus that ties everything together is the mission. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I there. I've. I think a filmmaker has one mission, which is I want to be able to make films because I. I think it was Ron Howard was being interviewed and they talked about you know what's your what's your goal for this film? I forget what film it was, and he said it's the same as my goal for every other film that it does well enough that I can make another film. It's a valid goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but then specifically, I've always you know been looking for ways to incorporate my faith with my filmmaking and see how, you know, cause I grew up on, uh, when I grew up church media for kids was really, really boring and not appealing at all, you know, Sunday school stuff. And I just wanted to find a way to, to tell Bible stories and, and teach biblical lessons, um, that in a way that I would have enjoyed when I was a kid. That, that's, so that's kind of been the goal of everything is like, how do I, how do I, be creative while combining my faith with my creativity. I think that's smart to, um, when you're making content, kind of think like, would I enjoy watching this type of thing? You know? Yes. Like right. if, you, if you wouldn't enjoy watching it, you can expect other people to enjoy watching it. That's right. You know? and, and, what, and at the same time, it's hard to, because some people will, when they make kids content, and you see this with bad kids content, they try to imagine what kids will find funny. And then they try to do what they think kids will find funny rather than doing what you find funny. Cause you know, if it, if you don't find it funny, there's a pretty good chance that it's just not funny. Uh, so you kind of have to do what you find funny and then hope that other people will come along, you know, and then that's when you find out if you have a career in, in making stuff with your sense of humor is when you discover if people agree with you that what you thought was funny, they think is funny too. So, you know, the first time I showed the first VeggieTales video to people was kind of a big deal because they laughed. They're like, okay, that's a really good sign. I would say that's definitely a good sign, yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes I feel like, you know, if you work on something for so long, after a while, <laughs> like you said in your uh, in your biography, like it's not funny to you after you've worked on it for three years, right. you know? And then right. when you sit down and hear other people laugh, I'm sure that's a really great feeling. And it, it reminds you how you once felt about that joke long long ago or if they don't laugh at it you're like oh yeah well that was a that was a bomb won't do that again <laughs> well i used to think that was funny now i don't <laughs> yeah um so what's the process of coming up with new ideas i think one of your more recent projects would be mr phil tv yep yep it would um it's if you are a commercial artist or a commercial filmmaker meaning people you know, you're not independently wealthy and you're just financing your own hobby, like, you know, Phil Knight funding Leica animation or, you know, when you have a billionaire who's funding things, you uh, also have to think about where is there an opportunity to get something in front of people? 
you know, get something made, you know, so, so year one, it was, oh, VHS cassettes seem to be doing well in Christian bookstores. So maybe that's where I could do some storytelling, you know, and then it's, okay, what kind of stories could I tell that could end up on, in Christian bookstores on VHS cassettes? And 20 years later, you know, it's, okay, what kind of stories could end up on YouTube uh, as five minute shorts? you know, now let's brainstorm. What would I enjoy? So like, what's the opportunity, you know, to actually make something that might be sustainable? Um, Cause the goal is never, I, I just want to make one of these and then I want to never make anything else again for the rest of my life. That's never the goal. So you actually want the thing that you make to, to work so that people will ask you to make more. Uh, so I was looking at the opportunity in the market like, is there, you know, is, is YouTube working for kids? Is TikTok working for kids? Are VHS cassettes working for kids? The answer, no, not anymore. They're not, no, just don't even think about it. And then what would I enjoy making that would work in that format, you know, for that audience? Um, and it's like, what haven't I done? So after Veggie Tales, it was, you know, well, I told a lot of Bible stories, but I didn't really explain the Bible. So that led to the What's in the Bible series. So I'm going to sit down and explain the Bible, starting with Genesis and going all the way to Revelation. And then after that, it was, well, I've told a lot of Bible stories and I've explained the Bible, but I've never really talked about like some really cool people, you know, who were Christians throughout history and the amazing things they did. And so we, I did these segments in the Mr. Phil show where I did that. I want to tell, you know, stories of, of Martin Luther King Jr. and, uh, you know, Florence Nightingale and, you know, go all the way back to St. Augustine um, and tell kids, you know, the inspiring stories of some of these people whose Christian faith absolutely changed their lives and then their lives changed the world. So it's, you know, like, what haven't I done? Because I don't like to do the same thing over and over again very much. I find it boring. Yeah, like what haven't I done or what haven't I done lately? You know, so right now it's, wow, it's been a long time since I've really done narrative storytelling. I want to get back into doing some narrative storytelling because uh, I've mostly been in a, a teaching mode for the last, you know, 15, almost 20 years now. Well, there we go. And, you know, so many people know you as the creator of VeggieTales. And, you know, this is a VeggieTales podcast I'm talking to you on. You know, that's how I got introduced to your work. But you've done so much more than VeggieTales and stuff that goes even deeper than veggie tales you know and i think more people need to know about mr phil tv what's in the bible you know and a lot of yeah. people a lot of people do but it needs to be you know more people need to know about it and i think yeah. that's important well the uh, veggie thing kind of took off and had a life of its own and became you know a weird cultural touch point and it's very hard to do that twice you know, if you yeah. do something that becomes like, wow, that made my childhood. It's it's going to be, that's a high bar to try to jump over again. It's like, I'll do something else that becomes another generation's childhood. Like, no, you probably won't. You probably won't. But that doesn't mean, you know, you stop making stuff. You just keep making stuff because it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's also a big part of it. You got to have fun with what you're doing. Yep. So what do you believe? And this might be a tough question to kind of narrow it down to like a handful of morals. But what do you believe are some of the most important morals for kids or anyone to be taught in the world today? Oh, gee. Um, uh, well, right now, particularly in the U.S., but also in other parts of the world, we're having a hard time loving our enemies, a really hard time loving our enemies. We're having a very easy time demonizing our enemies and dehumanizing our enemies. And if kids see their parents doing that, you know, because they've gotten too sucked into the political fighting of left and right and conservative and liberal and, you know, Trump and anti-Trump, um, we're not doing a great job modeling loving our enemies for kids. So I think that's a really big one right now. Another one is just not being afraid, you know, because if God is the biggest, I don't have to be afraid of the boogeyman. I remember that from somewhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. And but but fear sells a lot. Fear sells really well. You know, so uh, we need to teach kids that they they don't have to be afraid and they don't have to um, they don't have to be afraid of people. They don't have to be afraid of ideas, um, you know, and that you can approach the world in a loving way. And it's, you know, it, God is there with you. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's really good. Um, cause if you go to any news platform nowadays, it, it's all fear driven stories and it yep. does sell. Yeah. They, whether they you're on the left fear. or the right, whether you're on the left or the right, the other side is out to ruin the world Yeah, and must be opposed. 
It's, it's like, become... wow, we're both saying this about the other side. So either one is right and the other is wrong and completely inverted, or neither of them are right. Yeah, and a lot of them don't come from like a like a biblical perspective. They come from yeah. a self-serving, this is my party and this is why you should follow us because we're going to fix right. this. I have the Bible right here. Yeah. I'm holding it yeah. up. And, so... and I alone can <laughs> fix it. Basically, I alone yeah. can save you. It's yeah, like that's if, a if really dangerous me. message. If anyone ever except Jesus says, I alone can save you, run away. Red flag. Definitely. Yeah, because then they're not really, you know, believing what they're telling you they believe. And they're not, you know, they're saying, I can save you through this. Go directly to the source. Don't go through. Yeah. Them. Yeah. You know, that's what I think anyway. What's it like creating content for kids and families like VeggieTales, which is a family show that everyone can enjoy? Or yeah. content for adults specifically, such as the Holy Post, because I would assume that's aimed yeah. exclusively to adults. It is. It is. Um, a lot of, you know, teens and tween age kids listen along with their parents, which I keep in mind. And I try not to do stories that, you know, parents wouldn't want their 13 or 14 year old to hear that are either too explicit or too, too disturbing. And I don't really like stories that are too explicit or too disturbing anyway. And then I throw in things that sometimes parents don't like, like the news of the butt, you know, where we just <laughs> do a random story that is somehow related to butts, whether in the animal kingdom or the human kingdom. Um, and people Talk say, why do you do that? And I say, because it made me laugh when I read that story. So I'm going to do it. But, then I, but I don't, but this is a grown up show. You shouldn't do things like that. And like, you know, it made me laugh. So I'm going to do it. So to a certain extent, I don't do it all that differently. <laughs> I'm still looking at, you know, what am I interested in? What do I find funny? Um, but for kids, you know, you, you are thinking about what's developmentally appropriate, you know, and they're basic concepts like you, you might talk to adults about uh, police corruption. You shouldn't talk to a four-year-old about police corruption because they need to first establish that the police are your friends. You know, so you, so in general, let's talk about the police being good when you're three and four and five. And then when you're older, then we'll introduce this very complex idea that some police might not always be good. You know, but that's a really disorienting concept if you're three or four. So wait a minute. So don't go to the police if I'm in trouble or don't trust adult an adult when I'm in trouble. Um, and, you know, so it's the same thing when when dealing with spiritual conversations is in that, you know, you're for young kids, you're talking about the goodness of God. You know, God made you special and he loves you very much. So you're dealing with very basic concepts that that establish what's most important, which is this underlying foundation of love. You know, then as they get older, you can talk about other things. You can talk about the behavior that God expects from us. You can talk about, you know, so you can get into more complexities as you, as they get older. Um, but I'm kind of a simple person, so it's never hard for me to simplify things, you know, for four-year-olds. It's, it's actually harder for me to super complexify things for adults. I like that less. And more people need to look at stuff like that. I'm not just trying to flatter you, but just like the way you described, it made so much sense. More people need to realize, you know, don't direct all the heavy stuff right. at right. the kids. And know? some people will say, oh, but kids are smart and you're underestimating their intelligence. It's like, no, I'm not underestimating their intelligence. I'm, I'm correctly assessing the fact that they're four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people don't look at it like that. Yeah. Or they're five. And, you know, I know that four or five year olds didn't get half the jokes in Veggie Tales because half the jokes in Veggie Tales were for their parents. Oh, we're not. And I'm finding that out now, you know? Yeah. We're not for four or five year olds. Four or five year olds don't find verbal humor compelling generally. You know, if someone falls down, that's hilarious. If someone passes gas, that's hilarious. If someone says a really witty remark based on a, a Monty Python episode, that means nothing to a five-year-old. So we're very clearly not doing any of that for five-year-olds. Um, but and that's why I always considered it more family entertainment than kids entertainment, because the goal was that every the whole family sits down and watches it together, which is why half of the time we were coming up with material that had made no sense to four-year-olds yeah it's definitely true i think more people need to look at veggie toes like that too you know <clears throat> yeah 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 because people have e <laughs> even after the bankruptcy i had uh some arguments with the new owners who were maintaining that veggie tales was a preschool show 
And, and, and my contention was, no, it's a satire of a preschool show. It's Bob the Tomato trying to do a preschool show and failing. And the humor is in that he's failing to do a preschool show, which is why he gets so cranky and bent out of shape. Do you know how hard it was to get a network to turn over an hour of airtime to a bunch of vegetables? Yeah. I mean, sometimes being certain of something just means highly probable. Highly probable. Who's Jorgen? The trucker. Who's the monkey? Well, it doesn't really matter now, does it? Oh, man. Now what am I going to tell Chester? Is that the monkey? No. I can't find it. <laughs> they were saying, no, you shouldn't be so cranky in a preschool show. I said, it's not a preschool show. It's a satire of a preschool show. So, you know, the core, we had a core fundamental definitional difference in how we viewed uh, the show, which was never intended to be a literal Barney the Dinosaur style preschool show. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but from my perspective here. Yes. The creator would know is kind of what I think. The person the who made the show, the would be creator, able to tell you. knows what his intention was. Yes. Someone else can say, "We are changing the show, and it is no longer you are no longer the person who gets to say what the show is." And we now say it's a, a preschool show. I was like, "Oh, whatever. Yeah, okay, go." <laughs> that's gonna be. That's gonna be. It's, rough. It was a little frustrating. I'm sure. It was a little bit frustrating, but you know. You get used to it after a while. It's like, okay, it's not my show anymore. If they want to give them crazy eyes with colored irises and have Larry act like he's on cocaine, then sure. <laughs> Bouncing all around the room. That yeah, like crazy. what the heck? <laughs> and he's talking about like eating was what did he eat? Like eating really smelly sardines. food and yeah, like sardines. it was crazy for sardines all of a sudden. Like this is <laughs> not canon. Sardines. This is not canon. <laughs> I watched one recently, um, one of the Netflix episodes. It's the one where Bob wants to join Larry Boy in his mission. And then Bob did not act like Bob. Bob was like, Larry Boy, I want to join you. <laughs> Please. And a lifelong dedication. Please. Oh, okay. So this is fun. Because, you know, your, your audience wants to know, like, stuff that they don't know already. You know, that they mm -hmm. haven't read in a blog or in my book or, or something. So the the guy who created the Netflix show, you know, I know him and I knew him for years beforehand. Not well, but we'd met before because uh, he's another Christian in Hollywood. So it's like we bump into each other at events. Hi. And so he calls me and says, hey, I'm going to do the new VeggieTales show. And I'm like, you're kidding me. That's great, I guess. And then I see the first he says he shows me the pilot for the first script. OK, the first pilot for the first script. And it starts out. The first line is Bob and Larry go out to play. And his name's Doug. And I said, Doug, Bob doesn't play. Ever. Bob works. He makes, you know, he, he makes stuff. He wants to put on a show. He doesn't play. And, and the answer I got back was, no, no, no. This is Bob before he became that Bob. Oh. So it's, a pre it's a prequel show? <laughs> so, <to> me. <laughs> so really what you're saying is, this isn't Bob. This Please. is just your own characters that you've made up and put into the shapes of the characters that I made. Well, even <laughs> like, more or less in the shapes of the characters. Yeah, you've made. more or less. <laughs> more or less. Like Bob goes out to play. Ah, eh, you're already, <laughs> you're already off. You're already out of canon. And I, I tried to explain it, but like, because the the best way I could explain Bob and Larry, which I thought, man, okay, once I explain it this clearly, they'll get it. And then they'll rewrite things and get back on to what Bob and Larry are. I said, Bob wants to help kids. Larry wants to help Bob. That's it. That's the show. And no, that's not, but that's not this show. This isn't, that's not the show we want to make. We want to make a show where Bob and Larry go out to play and just goof off. Like, okay, whatever. Anyway. That's kind of what it was, though. You know, riding bikes on the ceiling and yeah, right. Always like, some bouncing the... marshmallow coming through. What's the happening? <laughs> it's overstimulating for a kid too. I mean, I enjoyed aspects of it um, as an independent thing from Veggie Tales as a yes. cartoon. I sure. thought it was funny, sure. but as Veggie Tales, it didn't feel like Veggie Tales. Like I'll sit down and watch it sometimes, and I'm like, okay, this isn't Rack Shack and Benny. This is SpongeBob. 
So I'm going to yeah. enjoy it like SpongeBob. When they first announced it, uh, that Netflix was going to put up a bunch of money, you know, to do VeggieTales, new VeggieTales episodes, I was like, oh, uh, you want me to be in charge of the creative? And and they said, uh, no, we, we want to take it in a new direction. I was like, oh, um, okay. Yeah, I guess that's not me then. They said, well, could you want me to be in charge of like the teaching? Like, what are we teaching kids? And they said, no, we're going to put together a committee to give advice on the teaching. I was like, okay, do you want, what do you want me to do? And then they said, voices, do voices. Like, that's it. That's all you want me to do. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. And so the, then the fun part was, you know, my next thought is, well, it's going to cost you a lot <laughs> to not let me do anything else but voices. And they're like, yeah, it's a hit show. So yeah, what, what do you want? And this is some fun behind the scenes stuff. Um, and so I just threw out a number. I was like, like, you know, I want 20 grand an episode to do voices. And they're like, well, that's way too much. And I said, and I said, well, the guys in in The Simpsons get six hundred thousand dollars an episode, so it seems like twenty grand for a hit show would be kind of a deal. And they said, no, 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 they mean a kids show, a hit kids show. And I said, okay, well, the SpongeBob guys get sixty grand an episode, so you know that's been around as long as Veggie Tales. So I'm asking for a third of the SpongeBob guys. And they said, no, 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 that's still too much. I said, well, what do you have in the budget? What do you want to offer me? And they came back and said, SAG minimum. Okay, SAG is a Screen Actors Guild minimum is the lowest possible amount you can pay a union voice actor. <laughs> and, and so I said, bye, pass, not going to do it. I mean, that's, you know, that's a little bit in insulting guys. So you don't want me to write. You don't want me to, to oversee the teaching. You just want me to do the voices and you want to pay me the amount you would have to pay by law, uh, the, an entry level voice actor who's just joined the union. And so they said, okay, well, we'll go on without you. And then apparently someone higher up at DreamWorks said, hey, why isn't the, the guy who does Bob doing Bob? And they said, because he won't work for SAG minimum. And she said, we'll pay him more. It was that easy. She said, we'll pay him more. So they came back and agreed to pay me more. So I agreed to do it. But they wouldn't pay my wife more, which is why Junior is a new voice. So why do you sing all the time? Hold on, we got to see this. They're like, but we're going to pay her SAG minimum. And and my wife was like, I'm really, I, it was 150 episodes. They were uh, half episodes that they wanted her to sign up for. I was like, can I say no? And I said, yes. In fact, I'm going to ask you to say no because it's <laughs> insulting. It to, really is. Yeah, to get offered the minimum you could possibly be paid by law to do the characters that you originated. And no other involvement, man. That's and no other involvement whatsoever because they want to take it in a new direction, but they want it to sound like you you're approving it. You know, which is why when the character designs first came out and they looked like they were on drugs, people got mad at me. Like Phil, how could you do this? You're like, hold up, <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was fun. That was fun. And then and of that... course we got the uh, the Veggie Tales podcast. I guess we can touch on that. How much of that have you listened to? None. Um, I think I listened to the the demo, like the trailer and like, what? What's going on there? Yeah. So that was uh, so uh, have you watched any of the TBN show? All of uh, it, yes. OK, yeah. Good so, time. yeah. So I know the guys at TBN. So they called and said, hey, we we just negotiated a deal where we're going to fund a season of new VeggieTales episodes. And we want you and Mike and Kurt and everyone involved. <laughs> Get your sister, get your brother, call your uncle and your mother if you're missing any. I was like, oh, that would be fantastic. Let's do that. Um, and, you know, and so I thought that, like, if I do a really good job with this, like, because I wrote 18 episodes out of the 26, and I wrote the 18 episodes in like a year. So it was like just cranking them out. You know, we in the old days, we wrote two a year. I wrote two a year. And that's what we produced because that's as fast as we could produce. But this was 18 episodes in a year. It's like, OK, I'm going to do these really fast. I'm going to make them as good as I can. I'm going to do all the voice work out of my house, directing myself so they don't have to spend any more or, or fly me anywhere. And I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to be really easy to work with. And when this is all done. I'll be in a position to say, hey, I would like a bigger role going forward. Don't you see how things are better when I'm involved? 
Seems logical. Um, and Mike did too. Mike wrote a few and he was, you know, he did his own recording in Nashville. And so I was like, hey, we were easy to work with. The creators, if you, you know, because there was a rumor that I was not easy to work with going way, way back from uh, a producer that didn't get along with me right around the time of the bankruptcy and decided I needed to have less say over the show and argued against me being there. So, but that was like 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier. So like, I'm going to dispel that once and for all. And after this, I'm going to ask for a bigger role. So we finish that show, get it all done. Everyone's happy. Um, I get a call from the head of Big Idea who says, hey, we're going to do a podcast um, and we can't afford to pay you to do any creative on it. So we'll just have you do the voice. And <laughs> like, OK, I can't do that anymore. I can't be just the voice anymore. So I either need to have a bigger role in the show overall um, or I think I need to be done. And uh, she said, uh, but the bigger role is my job. That's my job. That's what I do. I was like, okay, then. <laughs> so she said, bye, bye. And then I got a call from TBN right after that with the guy who'd produced the TBN series and said, what did you do? I just was told I need to cast for new voices for VeggieTales for the podcast. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm, you do. Because I think I just got myself fired. So anyway, that's how that all went down. It was it was partly partly because even Big Idea wasn't thrilled with the Netflix show because it was kind of out of their hands. DreamWorks was doing all the approvals on creative. Um, so and there was only, you know, like two people at Big Idea at that point. It was just a little skeleton crew. And I thought, OK, I'm going to make TBN show feel like classic veggies with Bob and Larry being Bob and Larry. And hopefully that will be my audition to be given the reins of the series again. Um, and then I found the next very next thing they asked for was, hey, would you just do voices? Because we don't want to pay you enough to do anything else. <laughs> like, oh. So back to back to square one again, right? Yeah, we're back like to we made, square one. Made some progress and then took yeah. a leap back. I wrote 18 episodes in 12 months and did all the directed myself for all the voice recording. Oh, and wrote all the songs for 18 episodes. I don't it was like. 50 songs that I wrote, you know, in that period of time. It's like, okay, I don't know what else I could do to make you think that maybe it's better with the creators involved than than this. But I don't know. This I mean, anyway. The TBN show was so good. Larry was physically glowing with excitement. I, mean I know, I know. He <laughs> could not he could not hold inside his enthusiasm. <laughs> Yeah, that was my frustration with the TBN show uh, was that I had no role in editing or pacing and everything I write, you know, my dialogue is pretty snappy. I tend to write snappy dialogue and I would see a rough cut of, you know, all the voices cut together and, and where I had written it. Hey, Larry, what are we going to do today? I don't know, Bob. What should we do today? Oh, and Paul Grape comes through. I don't think we should do something like this. You know, and so it's just like people going back and forth. And then I see the rough cut and it's, um, hey, Larry, what are we going to do today? I don't know, Bob. What are we going to do today? And then Paw Grape, beat, 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 beat. What if we did something like this? <laughs> My guys, no, no, faster, faster. <laughs> so it's still, they sped it up, they, they cut it a little bit tighter, but it was still like, I did not write the dialogue to run at that. They were kind of pacing it like a preschool show. Again, there you, you go. know, once, yeah, once again, it's a yeah, my arch, show. my arch nemesis, the preschool show that supposedly <laughs> is Veggie Tales. It's like, no, you're talking too fast for four year olds. It's like, I, I, this, I'm not writing this dialogue for four year olds. I'm writing this dialogue to, to crack up their older siblings and their parents. And the, the four year olds will come along just because the veggies are cute and the music is fun. And at the end, they do actually slow down for the lesson, which is what Bob and Larry always did. It's like, OK, kids, now it's time to talk about what we learned today. And we slow it down and we go into Mr. Rogers mode for the four year olds. But that was after we'd done, you know, really goofy, bizarro stuff like half of Mike's silly songs, I don't think would get made today by current management because they would just find them too weird. You know, they like them now. They say they like them because they're classics. No one can say they don't like the cheeseburger song. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's a classic. <laughs> well, as far as they're concerned, they made the cheeseburger song, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's one of our that's some of our finest work. Anyway. We've been, we've been here since the beginning, and here are some of the songs we wrote back then. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. Don't we get could, me started. We could go down a rabbit hole there. I've read all those uh 
the recent conversations with yes, you and Nintendo. Yeah, I the tweets. Can't I believe all that. I I was keeping most of that private because I was trying to, you know, maintain a really good relationship with them so that I could actually show them, hey, you should probably have him be in charge of the, the creative on this show. He might know it better than you. Um, but you know, when when I did all the work in the world and and then it was still like, no, nope, you don't get to touch the toys. There are toys now. I'm like, all right, well then I'm I may be done not mentioning that you said they're your toys now. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I mean, I can't blame you. I'm glad you're being vocal about it because it's there's well, so much behind the scenes stuff people don't know about and it's, yeah, it's sad. It's right. sad. And now right. I have a Larry Boy movie coming out, which like I initially saw that and I was like, there's no way they're gonna make a movie about a character that Phil Vischer created without Phil Vischer. Like I saw it and I was like, I I, I don't think they're gonna You don't think that's possible? Up. You don't well, think that's possible? I oh mean, <laughs> yeah, well then I, you know, you. saw your tweet. I saw your tweet and I was like, oh no, here we go again. <laughs> yeah. When someone <laughs> when someone announces a new movie about one of your characters and you learn about it on Twitter, it's like, oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder how long it will take before someone calls me to, you know, and is it, what I don't, I still don't know what they're, if they're going to ask me to do anything or if at some point they're just going to say, oh, hey, uh, we'll pay you some money if you do the voice of Alfred, you know, Archibald. Oh, Laddie Boy, Laddie Boy, we need Laddie Boy. It's like, no, it's so much easier just to hire somebody else to do it and, you know, pay them SAG minimum. And <laughs> it's hard to work with creators because the thing about creators is they feel like they made the darn show. And that makes them, you know, can make them a little bit. No, no, Phil, Phil, you're just you're just the voice. Yes, you're the you're voice. Just, the, Act, just, <laughs> just and I don't even describe it as being the voice anymore. I describe it as making the noises like they 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 want the noises of Bob. They don't really want the voice of Bob because the voice of Bob is what he's talking about as much as the sound that he's making. And, you know, so what they really want is, would you would you make those Bob noises in the in the shape of this script? <laughs> well, they want it to be recognizable. So it sells for them, you know, yeah. like, hey, people recognize your voice and we don't want anyone thinking there's anything going on. So, just yeah. Oh, no, no, no. That looks like Mike and Phil are still here because look, Bob and Larry still sound like Bob and Larry. They, or like on the, the uh, Netflix show, they just look like crazed <laughs> <laughs> vegetables doing ridiculous things that they never, never, but they still sound like Bob and Larry. So Mike and Phil must think this is all great. So it must that, be Phil's fault. <laughs> it must be Phil's fault. Yeah, let's let's yell at Phil for that. My favorite comment on the Netflix show uh, was somebody wrote in and, and said, it's like watching Mr. Rogers take off his cardigan sweater and put on a, a leather motorcycle jacket. <laughs> like, That's yep. a great description of it. That's, uh, that's pretty <laughs> yep. accurate. <laughs> that was a Netflix show. Nothing against motorcycle jackets. I like the Fonz from Happy Days, you know, so that's a good character, but he's not Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers is something fairly distinct, and so were Bob and Larry, but what are you going to do? Well, as somebody who's watched the series, I mean, from the beginning, all the Netflix shows, all the spinoffs, I've seen everything. It's very it's very easy to see the differences. Like, if you watch yeah. The Ballad of Little Joe... And then watch, I don't know, any of the Netflix episodes. You don't recognize them as the same show. Not just visually, but also how they're written and the pacing and the yeah. hyperactive. Characters. Yeah, I guess I guess DreamWorks decided the old show was was like aged, you know, like it looks old fashioned now. This this happened. Do you know Davy and Goliath? That stop motion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Christian stop motion show from the 70s or late 60s it was produced by the Lutheran Church. Churches don't usually do kid shows, but this one was actually kind of good because it was animated by Art Clokey, who did uh, uh, Gumby. Uh, it was the, the guy who animated Gumby was a Lutheran, and the Lutherans hired him to do a show. So they did, and it was really, it's really kind of a cute, dorky show with cute, dorky characters. And I actually liked it when I was a kid. They reached out to me at one point when VeggieTales was big. The Lutheran Church reached out to me to say, we want to do a new updated version of Davy and Goliath, which is about this little boy and his dog. They're very dorky um, and old fashioned. But we want to update it. So we think that Davy should do extreme sports, like he should do skateboard stunts. I'm like, that is not Davy and Goliath. Okay, Davy and Goliath, the charm of Davy and Goliath is how old fashioned and dorky these characters are. Okay, 
Davey on a skateboard is just another, you know, it would have been at that point, late 1990s kids show. Just, you know, Mickey Mouse on a skateboard, putting everyone on a skateboard so our characters are still relevant. Gonna work on my moves and do a alley hoop. I'll do a make a twist, a 50 and a loop de loop. I did it! <laughs> so I always hated attempts to do that. Like someone would try to sneak something, you know, up to date, you know, into VeggieTales. Um, so and cool. yeah, yeah. Like I don't know. They're, they're from a different, uh, there's something timeless and weird and dorky about them that I really like. So I think the Netflix show was just the ultimate, you know, we're going to make an up-to-date Veggie Tales for up-to-date kids. It's like, okay, then leave me out of it. Just leaves your head spinning if you watch it all the way yeah. through. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. This is just someone, this is just a different show with my characters in it. And no, that doesn't bother me at all. Not one little tiny bit. No, uh -huh. the, the, the podcast, I will say something about that. Two things I noticed very consistent in the podcast. I'm not sure if this is even relevant. I just thought it'd be funny to mention it to you since you haven't listened to it. They've had the characters consume pasta like five times, like loudly into the microphone. Oh. Like slurping noodles, crunching oh. noodles. Uh, Mr. Nezzer opened a noodle factory in one of the last episodes they did. Okay. So it's like just noodles for some reason. I don't know if there's okay. like some. Well, it's hard to reasoning. it's hard to find things that vegetables can eat. I guess that's possible. Yeah. That don't like if they eat vegetables, that's disturbing. If they eat meat, it's a little weird. Like a you know a vegetable eating a chicken, that's a little weird. Yeah. So, that so that's why be. we always went with we tended to go with pizza because I don't think kids view pizza as made from anything. You know, like there's no no other animals or plants used in the making of pizza. Until it just Larry comes... dropped tomato sauce in the middle of Pizza Angel. Oh yeah, that's disturbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tomato sauce and cheese, so gooey. Uh, and then waffles. Like the, the the list of food that I had to come up with for the Going to the Promised Land song in Josh and the Big Wall. Now we're going to the promised land. I hear it's flowing with milk and honey. Sounds sticky. Uh, trying to come up like, okay, milk and honey. I think we can do that. That won't offend anybody. And we did waffles and uh, I like a, a cheese souffle. I'm trying to remember the other foods that I had to come up with that wouldn't be disturbing, you oh, know, because they, they were all because they'd eaten nothing but manna, you know, for 40 years. And so they were so hungry. And so I had to come up with a list of foods that vegetables could compellingly desire without tacos. it sounding gross. Yeah, I think tacos in there because, again, it's like a product. You know, you don't think about there's cow and there's tomato and there's lettuce you just think taco it's like pizza <laughs> there's no ingredients it's just pizza from a kid's point of view so and what but waffles are probably waffles and popcorn see popcorn that comes off a of corn which is technically well i guess a fruit no seeds are on the outside i'm not even sure what a corn is it's the seeds no i don't know either anyway the seeds are like within the cob somewhere i don't know yeah, they're inside the husk, so maybe it's seeds on the inside, so it's a fruit. Vegetable lore goes so deep. We could talk about that forever. <laughs> yeah, I can't keep up. The promised land Jimmy's like, bring me a, a hunk of steak. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some of that cow to chew on. Mm, <laughs> yum. And then Jerry. Yeah, yeah, meat. <laughs> meat eater. You chose wisely. You chose yeah. very wisely. Carnivore. <laughs> hearing you do the voices in real time is just i don't know it's just it's just tripping me up you know it's like my little my little kid self is coming out again and i'm like yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, oh my gosh. it's always fun to go talk at colleges i do like chapel at colleges and the first thing i do because i can tell what the room is going to be like is do voices you know and and typically it's just oh yep they grew up on veggie tales because they just go nuts if it, sometimes it's for grown-ups and i don't get a reaction to voices and then i know it's like okay they didn't have kids in the 90s or their 2000s and they weren't kids in the 90s or 2000s they're not gonna like any of my jokes yeah well then that's when you put a veggie tales video on the screen before the seminar you're like watch this and then we'll talk yes so does this <laughs> make any sense because if it doesn't then nothing else i say will make any sense <laughs> what makes for when you're creating a character, any character, Bob, Buck Denver, my personal favorite, Plinky Pete, um, <laughs> what makes for a likable character? Voice-wise, design-wise, what oh, do you think of? I definitely know when I don't like a character. Um, 
And, and it's, you know, some characters are just made to be irritating or made to be aggressive. You know, so uh, the simplest thing is Bob and Larry are made entirely of round shapes. You know, it was, it was like Mickey Mouse was so appealing as opposed to Felix the Cat, because Felix the Cat had really sharp angles. Mickey Mouse was made of circles. And we are just drawn to circular, soft circular shapes, Hello Kitty kind of shapes. So I wanted that kind of almost Hello Kitty cuteness in the characters. Um, but a character that like Barney is basically soft and squishy, but I don't like him, Barney the dinosaur. We and the reason I... Him. The reason I don't, well, besides that, I didn't like him before then. Um, the reason I don't respond, and most adults don't respond well to Barney, is that he is never in, in on the joke. Like, he's not self-aware, you know, so he's sincere 100% of the time. So he never jokes at his own expense. He never winks to the audience, never winks to the parents in the room, you know, never breaks the fourth wall in a funny way. So there's just a, a complete lack of irony. So I think grownups, like grownups didn't trust Barney the dinosaur and were confused why their kids liked him so much. Um, and it's because he would not let parents in on a joke with them. So I, I like characters that let you in on a joke, you know, and that make a joke at their own expense. I think that's compelling. But also characters that don't... Uh, honestly want to hurt anyone you know bob can be uh bob can be cranky but he's not mean-spirited you know so he doesn't want to hurt anyone he gets very frustrated with people um larry is always going to be more popular than bob because larry is is an innocent you know he's the innocent fool he's the you know the forrest gump it's a long list of innocent fools that we love um because they're childlike and because they just want people to be happy you know, they just want the world to be smiling, uh, whereas people like Bob have ambition. Uh, and and so whenever you have ambition in a character, it'll turn the character very easily from someone you're rooting for to someone who's causing problems for others, which Bob does. And, but, it, but does it in an innocent way, not a mischievous way, you know. So, yeah, the ideal character that you love is is someone who's innocent um, just trying to make other people happy, just trying to make the world better. But in a very, and then it's funny if, if they don't do it very effectively, because you know? <laughs> if someone's really effective at improving the world and making everyone happy, you know, that's mother Teresa. It's like, yay, yeah, give him an award, whatever. But to see Larry, you know, like try to help Bob and actually make things worse. That's funny. Those are the characters I like. You need to be good natured. You know, I don't like characters that are honestly mean spirited. Yeah. And like the comedy yeah. comes from how unlikable they are almost. Yeah. 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 Or, or uh, characters that are insincere about everything, you know, because when I was making Veggie Tales, one of the hit shows, you know, MTV was really popular. And one of the hit shows was Beavis and Butthead. And Beavis and Butthead became really popular because it was just two guys that mocked everything, it became very popular with kind of jaded teenagers. Um, and I despise that kind of character building where, it, you know, it's characters that laugh, uh, that believe the world is a joke, you know, because at the end of the day, our lives are not a joke and it's, and it's a very depressing place to find yourself in, you know, if you think your life is a joke. So characters that take everything as a joke, I don't think have any ability to connect emotionally you know, with you or each other, which is why it's really important that Bob and Larry, and this is the balance. It's like, okay, you want it to be funny, but you want it to be sincere. So you want Barney's sincerity with Monty Python's sense of humor. Uh, if you know the Monty Python guys, they don't really take life very seriously, you know, um, but so, so you have to mix those two. So like what's halfway in between Barney and Monty Python. And that's, that's where I was aiming with Bob and Larry and pretty much all the characters I make, you know, whether it's the puppets from what's in the Bible or they're, 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 they know better. Um, they know there's a joke. They're in on the joke. They'll let you in on the joke, but deep down they sincerely believe in something. And I think that's key. Even Mickey Mouse, you know, he started out very mischievous in his history. Um, 
but because it was really in the early days of animated shorts, it was really just showing what you could do with drawings. <laughs> you know? So this is a mouse that uses a cat as an accordion, you know, and I can draw this and now it looks like it's real. And people say, that's amazing. And it's funny. The mouse is using a cat as an accordion. The cat is shrieking in pain. That's funny. <laughs> and then as, as people got used to that, you could draw things then it became, you see, you, Mickey's evolution into a caring character who would never pick up a cat and play it like an accordion. Would never do that. Never pull the udders on a cow to make it make music. No, never do that. Um, so it's interesting to see, you know, even in the evolution of, of Disney characters going for, uh, these characters need to have a moral base you know, a, a moral code. And then you can have villains who also have a moral code, but it's an inverted moral code. They still have a moral code, but it's not just, you know, chaos. Because early cartoons were just chaos. Fritz the Cat and some of those just doing, just blowing stuff up, squeezing hats, you know, whatever, making planes crash just to show that you could draw it. Um, and that's, those aren't compelling characters. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with, Every character you created, the villains have oh, a goal. Well, the, the good guys all have a reason why they're good. They're all well intentioned. I think Bob is maybe the best example. Larry as well. Um, yeah, I like good intentioned guys that can't figure out how to make their good intentions happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, as for comedy too, you know, it makes you like the character because you relate to them. Yeah, it's yeah. So, often. so in my mind, Bob the Tomato is a frustrated Mister Rogers. He wants to be Mister Rogers. He dreams at night of being Mister Rogers he can't pull off being Mr. Rogers. He just can't pull it off because the whole world conspires against him, you know, and his plans. So a frustrated Mr. Rogers is the place I write Bob from. And then Larry has no ambition whatsoever. So he doesn't get frustrated by the fact that Bob can't pull off Mr. Rogers and that the show's going horribly wrong. But Larry just wants to help. I just want to help. But half of the things he suggests actually make it worse, but funnier. You know, so that's the tension. It's like, like, help me be, you know, you know, the painter, Bob Ross, you know, he's that kind of the guy who paints happy little trees, that, that kind of show. And that's kind of, you know, was some of the seed behind Veggie Tales was the kind of kids show where everything goes perfectly coordinated, like the, like the host is God and can just make everything happen. And he's never upset. He's never unhappy. He's always talking in calm tones. All the cues on the set happen on time, exactly like he wants them to. So there's no reason for Mr. Rogers to ever be unhappy. So then you take Bob, who wants to do that, but he can't make it work, you know, which is why he doesn't like the song at the end of the show, because he doesn't know who's pushing the button to make the song play. Because he didn't say he wanted a song there. He didn't even say he wanted a song at the end of his show. Someone somewhere made a song and pushes the button every time they get the end of the show. And he's like, uh, this is not why. Where is it coming from? Who's doing this? I'm supposed to be in charge. God has a lot to say in his As I was saying, see, we know. and you know, people say, yeah, but it's a song about God's word. So are you saying Bob doesn't like God's word? It's like, no, I'm not saying that. Bob doesn't like not being in control. And it's the song that comes out of nowhere at the end of every kid's show. And, he, and it annoys them. And it made me laugh to think of that. The people who ask that question, it's like they didn't watch the rest of the episode. It's like Bob hates God's word. He just taught you about it for 30 yeah. minutes, but he hates right. God's word. Right. <laughs> Once again, I appreciate you cool. making time for such a small little podcast, too, you know? That's okay. Well, this is how it goes big. This is this that's true. Is... So, Phil mm -hmm. Vischer, on the 2006 Veggie Tales DVD, <laughs> I noticed that there was an art gallery, and Larry Boy's plunger was tilted slightly sideways. And what right. can you tell me about this? And you're like, right? Oh, it was like those, those are the people I've interviewed. <laughs> absolutely nothing. It's like I, I, have, I have no idea. No, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no, I have no idea, <laughs> but it's sweet. You know, people just, people mm -hmm. just really care. Oh yeah. And I'll just kind of, I'll just kind of sit back and let him talk to you, dude. Dario, can you hear us? Oh, hello. There oh. he is. <laughs> you are hey, on man. with Phil Vischer. Hey, Phil. What's going on? Well, I'm doing a podcast with Finn. What are you doing? I have no clue. Oh, okay. I'm never... sitting in a chair. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's nice to meet you. I sent you the document, right? So you have your question at the bottom. I, I do want to keep Phil on here forever, but, you know, Phil's, Phil's a busy My wife will not allow it. <laughs> If you think a creator 
can get cranky for having his characters stolen, just you need to talk <laughs> to a creator's wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> wives can be the most defensive people, you know, of of their like if someone wrongs their husband and and yeah, and the same thing with Mike's wife. It's like, oh, it's okay, honey. It's no big deal. I was like, no, it is a big deal. And I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. And it's like, oh, <laughs> calm, calm down, calm down. Don't, don't, don't put down the phone. Do not tweet. Whatever you do, do not tweet about that. <laughs> that would make for a great episode. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dario, ask me a question. Uh, if you were to gain creative control again, what would be your main priority? Uh, I assume you're talking about veggie tales. I'm just going to yes. guess that you're talking about <laughs> Veggie Tales. If I were to gain creative control of Veggie Tales, my priority, and this is what I would have done ten years ago too, is uh, assess the world of kids media, see uh, what the opportunities are, and what kids' needs are right now. Like, what do kids need to be learning right now, and how do they like to learn it? How do they like to watch shows? Um, and then start brainstorming ideas, you know, basically to meet kids' needs in a way that kids like. Uh, and that, you know, I, I would assume, like right now, that might lead us to TikTok. It would definitely lead us to YouTube and YouTube Kids app um, and trying to do more short form stuff. Either that or, you know, full length movies, uh, the the middle of like half an hour stories is not working well with kids right now. So either, you know, make the trolls movie and send them to the theater or make a whole bunch of, you know, like <laughs> Coco melon length shorts and reintroduce the characters slowly over time on, uh, on social media. That's probably where I would start. Oh boy. Coco melon. Uh, <laughs> Coco melon. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if you thought Barney ooh. was not very sophisticated. <laughs> yeah my parents were uh a friend of my mom's tried to introduce me to barney and my parents could not handle it they're like we're di we'll just stick with the vegetables thank yes. you <laughs> yes thank you yes the dinosaur has no sense of humor yeah um how did you come across blender oh that's a good question i every time i go this is probably for the last five years, every time I go to Barnes and Noble to hang out and look around, I'd always pick up a copy of, you know, like 3D World and 3D Animator. There's those British magazines that cost like 25 bucks a copy um, and just thumb through them just to say, like, what's going on in the world of CGI? And I wasn't looking for it online very much because I because it was. It, I didn't think it was possible for me, like, you know, I'm too old now. You're not allowed to learn new things. Once you pass 50, you just have to go with what you know. Um, but I knew that Blender existed. And I had at one point, like five or six years ago, I downloaded just a demo of Cinema 4D um, just to see, you know, how hard would it be to make some like backgrounds for my puppets? And I played around with that a little bit. Uh, but didn't put in enough time to learn it. And there isn't nearly the kind of, you know, YouTube tutorial community for for Cinema 4D that there is for, for uh, Blender. And so I was thinking about that again, like a year and a half ago. Uh, and it was about, maybe I could make 3D sets to put my puppets, green screen my puppets into. And that would be easier than me trying to illustrate backgrounds, which I'm not very good at. I'm better at 3D. Um, and so I just, on a lark, I thought, I'm just going to download Blender because it's free. I looked at Maya, you know, again, because that's what we used in the last days of, of Big Idea. And it was like a ridiculous amount of money to subscribe to it. And then I just want to play with Blender. And then I started watching tutorials on YouTube. And it's like, oh, I I remember how this works. Only it's much easier now. I'm going to, I, I want to <laughs> see how far I can push this. I'm going to watch lots and lots and lots of YouTube tutorials where 14 year olds from Ukraine are teaching me how to do computer animation. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> and it was really fun. So I just kept going. It's so crazy you say that because Blender, I just learned this recently. Blender's been around since what, 1995? Yeah. Yeah. It's really old, but it was, you know, it was a hobby for a yeah. long, long time that you really couldn't use in serious production. And and I knew that. So, it, you know, my thought is Blender is something that high school kids use that isn't very good. Um, but then I thought, okay, a few years have gone by since I last, you know, heard of it. So I bet it's better now. And it's like, wow, it's really good. 
I mean, you're not wrong about the high school part. <laughs> yeah, that's well, when I started using it. And and there's also this whole community now of kids that started using Blender, you know, in high school around the world. Um, and you can find them on Upwork and you can find them on Fiverr, you know, and you could hire a modeler or an animator from the other side of the world um, or just, you know, hire someone to teach you how to, to explain something to you. Yeah. So it's really it's interesting to dive in all the people writing add ons and plugins and modeling things to sell. You know, it's like I need a castle. Oh, here's 10 different castles you could buy on Blender Market or, uh, you know, some on one of the other markets and just download it. And now you have something to start with. So it really started to blow me away. Like this is so much easier than it was 25 years ago. And it's free and it's free <laughs> and they'll sell you like, oh, that you can buy this whole castle for, you know, seven dollars. Like it would you'd take you 50 hours to make I mean, you can buy it for seven bucks or eight bucks from a, a kid in the in uh, the Philippines. It's a crazy world. Yeah, I assume you followed the the donut tutorial like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I never did the donut. I, I Me neither. I, I never did. I'm familiar with the donut tutorial and I've recommended it to other people who say, oh, I think my son wants to learn how to do computer animation. And I said, well, download Blender and do this donut and then you'll be well on your way. Was the donut glazed? Um, it is frosted with sprinkles. All right. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Because the sprinkles teach particle systems. Or bacon. You could go with bacon. Bacon. Well, yeah. Let's no. not go back to bacon now. That makes me think of bacon bill. <laughs> That's disturbing. Was that his name, Bacon Bill? Bacon I seem to. Bill. Yeah, yeah. We didn't, even, we didn't even touch on Bacon Bill. No, probably, probably best. <laughs> we don't need to. <laughs> out of this, out of all the stuff, Big Idea and you have put out. If you were to re-release anything that's lost media to the public regarding Veggie Tales, what is one thing that you would want the public to be able to experience? Well, obviously, it would be the Veggie Tales live show. Obviously. Uh, you, did you tell you him, knew Finn? What to say. You knew what to say. <laughs> look, at that, look, at that, look at that smile. I, I was follow, expecting, I was I expecting follow like, you on Twitter, man. <laughs> Phil knows what to say. <laughs> or, or what would also be fun uh, is the large scale puppet shows that we did at Silver Dollar City in Dollywood. Oh and, my gosh, yes. Yeah, and I don't <laughs> think we did one with the pirates who don't do anything, and it was large scale puppets, not like the suits that people are in, but really big puppets that, you know, a college kid was underneath like hard fiberglass puppets with moving features. They were pretty cool. And a and a big pirate ship set that, you know, shot smoke out into the audience. Those were fun. I don't know if anyone ever filmed one of those shows. Yeah, I remember there was like a behind the scenes or whatever. They were showing a, a reenactment of Rack Shack and Benny. And it shows this guy controlling like a bike handle. It's ridiculous. He's like moving back and forth with this bike handle controlling yep. Mr. Nezzer. Yep. Well, what's that over there? That's the furnace. What's it for? That's where all the bad ones go. Let's just say that in my mind, if you don't bow down and sing the butter song, you're a bad buddy. Phil, if you're looking for some footage of that, I found like maybe one YouTube video of it. Uh, really? But it's hidden okay. under like some, I don't know, like, you know, those like date YouTube titles where it's like 3 27 09. It's Junior singing I'm a Promise, and it's pretty cool. Wacky, wacky world. <laughs> I guess while we're on the topic of live, uh, every, there are a bunch of people who come up to me and say they used to have a tape, and I don't even know if it's a hoax. I, I <laughs> There might have been a tape. I don't know. Um, some, <laughs> sometimes people ask me questions as if I have a completely exhaustive, infallible memory of everything we ever did, and I do not. So please, describe, please describe frame 72. Of, yes. of Sherlock Holmes and the Golden Ruler. What ah, that yes, that's one of my favorite frames. That's <laughs> it was innovative for these twelve reasons. Um, yeah, I probably could dig up the script to the live show. Uh, at least one. It went through a lot of versions. I don't know if I have any art. I might have some art from the live show. I have boxes and boxes of stuff in storage. 
you know, when I had to clean out my office at Big Idea, which was a kind of a depressing day. <laughs> it's like, you're done. You're fired. Clean out your office and go home. Okay. Wow. I have a lot of stuff. And I've just been carting around all that stuff. Like uh, the plans for the, th the studio building in downtown Lombard. I still have the architectural drawings. There's some, I got some crazy stuff. Yeah. When you said you packed Bob and Larry in a box and like those, uh, what was it? The college, uh, you like would talk at a college or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't think you meant like you literally packed Bob and Larry in a box. I thought it was more of like, you know, I just it was it was a metaphor, but also literal. It was both. <laughs> yeah. In fact, when I the first time I visited. Uh, when was that? The first time I visited the new offices that the new company had set up in Nashville they had the giant plush Bob and Larry. No, it was just Bob, a giant plush Bob sitting right inside the front door, looking out the window. And I'd never been there before to the new big idea. And there was Bob staring at me through the glass. <laughs> the only thing I could think of, it was like a dog, you know, waiting for his <laughs> owner to come home. You know, like, <laughs> He's been waiting for me all this time by the front door. Bob, it's me. Do you remember me? <laughs> He didn't jump up on me, though. <laughs> I assume uh, Finn brought up uh, Tornado Hunters also. I did tornado not get to that. No, we, Tornado we, oh. Hunters are we. We catch tornadoes in our bags and throw them into trees. To trees, to trees, we throw them into trees. Yes, what about it? Tornado Hunters are we. Tornado Hunters are we. We catch tornadoes in our nets and throw them into trees. To trees, to trees, we throw them into trees. We catch tornadoes in our nets and throw them into trees. It's so weird well, we that, go. like, <laughs> That's what you, we you wrote, they converted that into a silly song like your song right i, I don't yeah. know if they was, rewrote a new mine. version um, yeah um, yeah it was a it was a uh i think like a stretched version of mike and my tornado hunter song from bible college so crazy then, that that's one then, of the songs you wrote in a long time like a uh, silly song wise because you had yeah the water buffalo song and that one just got shelved because of a tornado because of a tornado yeah, it's like, oh, we can't release this now. Why? Well, there was a tornado in the Bible Belt, and a couple of people died, so it's not funny anymore. We're like, oh, can we change it to a fictitious storm? <laughs> a VR storm. Larry puts yeah. on his VR chat headphones. Yeah, I guess well, that's, that's probably something we'll never see then. It was done. It we have really a clip. It okay. leaked on the DVD. You know the little like uh, oh. main selection things where it shows the video playing. Oh, so they pulled the silly song from the last video and put it on there. But we have a clip of Larry and Jimmy and Nezer with their nets, like walking into the storm. And wow. like the whole fandom has just gone crazy. Like, what's, what's the song sound like? What's wow. the rest of the video? What's the story? We have like 10 seconds of blurry footage. Yeah. So so Mike and I were at Bible College in uh, rural Minnesota. And it's one big building in the shape of a cross with all the dorms and all the classrooms and everything in the one building. It, it at one point was a Jesuit seminary, and then the Jesuits sold it to uh, St. Paul Bible College. And um, they had a tornado warning. And so everyone had to, you had to go to the lower level and to interior halls and sit with your back against the wall. Everyone, like, you know, 800 students, 1,000 students, something like that. And Mike and I were like, no. No, we're not going to do that. So I put on, I had a pith helmet because you always need to bring your pith helmet to Bible college. And so I put on my pith helmet and we got garbage bags and we got rolls of toilet paper. And instead of going down to where you're supposed to shelter in place, we ran outside to see if we could find the tornado. And, and our strategy was we were going to throw rolls of toilet paper up into the air to see where the, if the tornado would catch them and swirl them around, then we'd know it was there. It was a good way to bring a tornado out of hiding. And then... Uh, we had garbage bags and then we would, we would, the, the toilet paper roll would lure the tornado back down to the ground and we would catch it in our garbage bags. That was our plan. That seems logical. I mean, that would have yeah. worked. I think. It, did I you think... see any flying cows? No, we did not see any flying <laughs> cows. It was night. So there could have been flying cows that we just didn't see possibly. <laughs> All right. You got one more question. Pick, pick the best of the remaining. Choose wisely, Dario. Gorsh. Uh, <laughs> uh, have you ever thought of doing a feature film using your characters from what's in the Bible? 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've thought about it. It would be, if you want to do puppets for a feature, you have to get so complex to make it good, you know, especially interacting with humans in the real world and hiding puppets and trying to do really tricky stuff, um, that it it gets way more complex than I enjoy doing hands-on myself. I don't mind complex animation because you can direct it, you know, kind of remotely with the team that's spread out. I don't like I like being the general in the room with everyone staring. I don't want to direct live action. So doing doing a puppet film would be too much like live action. I would rather take those characters than adapt them to animation or something and, and do something like that. So, yeah, I'd love to do that sometime. Well, there we go. Phil, thank you so much for joining. This was this was remarkable. You're welcome. Oh, now we turn on our cameras. Okay, no, I, I got ready. I got prepared and everything. Oh, you this look whole great. Time. <laughs> oh, thanks. You look no, great. I, I had the camera on them when you joined. I kind of stepped back. That was my way of showing I was giving you the floor, Dario. Um, oh, gee, thanks. You're welcome. You this have was, the. You have the floor. Great. I appreciate okay. you in, indulging us. Um, and joining a Veggie Tales podcast, I'm sure when you got an invite for a Veggie Tales fan podcast, you were like, ah, "Cool." <laughs> yeah, I yeah, because I'm not, I'm very introverted, and I have a limited amount. My my tank of social energy is like this big, you know. It's I like I, I love playing with my grandkids, but after a couple hours, it's like, <laughs> you know, I'm shriveling up like a grape turning into a raisin i was like what happened to papa phil well you sucked all the life out of him kids now get out of here <laughs> so and that's you know so like doing podcasts and stuff is kind of like that i have my own podcast but i it i'm in control i do it once a week and then i go lie down when it's done um but it's like there's stuff to talk about and there's more you know particularly if i am um, kind of have more of a distance from current management and i'm not feeling like i have to be quiet like when they were paying me to do voices and they're paying me to do stuff and it's like you don't want to be a jerk you know and and say things that will make them mad when they're paying you but when they say we're not going to pay you anymore it's like okay might as well, well talk about it right i don't really need to be quiet then so okay well, it's been very here we go it's been very enlightening even more so than the the recent tweets we've got some good information here yes this is going to yeah. put it on the map this is going to put it on the map <laughs> it's going to be a top 10 podcast do you want any um any voice requests while you have me any oh voice requests gosh. man you shouldn't ask me that <laughs> ben why don't we all do archibald huh oh shoot phil well i think phil probably has the best archibald voice here but, oh um... stop it <laughs> No, you stop it! <laughs> oh, oh, it's my long lost brother, Richibald. <laughs> Richibald. Mine is a little. I'm still working on mine. It's a little bit wobbly, but oh, hello, it's lovely. Hello there. <laughs> so good to see you. This is, this is splendid. It's a dream come true. Three Archibalds in one room. Oh, Did oh. anyone bring ham? Oh, lovely. Has anyone seen Larry Boy? I've been looking for Larry Boy. I hear he may be in business again, but no. No one's invited me to the party. <laughs> okay, Good. he's he's going to animate that now, just so you know. <laughs> Good heavens, no! We're just oh going to have three Archibalds in one room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what fun stretched. we're having. Chocolate pudding scraped across too much ham. Oh, <laughs> oh that's my favorite. See, I what? can't do the voice without going, oh! <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, yes, oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> let's, just... hear, uh, let's hear Jimmy. Oh. Hello, this is Jimmy Gord, and uh, actually, I think I could eat a whole planet. 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 <laughs> also known as the voice that goes, and sometimes Christian. Yeah. And, <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> Christian. Yeah. yeah. That's the, that's the, I've used that voice for a number of things, actually. It, well, it was Frankenstein in the first show. That's right. Yeah. Like, actually, I'm an actor from Toledo named Phil Winkelstein. Um, and then the, the third show, like, oh, let's do two Gord brothers, you know. And I mean, you guys know where they came from. They were our landlords, Jimmy and Jerry. And and we were both doing the voice of a former boss who was like, would just talk to you like, hey, hey, go do some work. <laughs> hey, you're not doing your work. Why aren't you doing your work? We thought, let's both do our impression of that guy, whose name was Jim, by the way. Let's both do our impression of that Jim as Jimmy and Jerry. And so we both started like, eh, 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 eh. 
It's like, okay, one of them needs to be able to talk in complete sentences. <laughs> so, <let's laughs> so, let's have, so Jerry became much more animated and talkative, and he could talk in whole paragraphs. And then I kind of turned Jerry when I would write Jerry, you know, into like Beaker in the background. It's like, <laughs> which is funny. It's a funny, like, good comic fun to learn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a That's funny great. combination. Jerry's based off Beaker. <laughs> <laughs> he he evolved in a Beaker-like direction. Where yes. you know, he, he became less and less verbal. <laughs> As time went by, no, but that's actually true. Like by the, I'd say the Veggie Tale show, he was he was done talking. He was like, I'm yeah. done with this. Waffles, me waffles. The other problem was that that there was less difference between Mike's Jerry and Mike's Larry, so that the more Jerry, those two voices are actually pretty similar in tone. So the the long, if I gave Jerry longer lines. It would just start to sound like Larry. Say you want a baked potato, leave it to the food all later. In a spotlight, sad, a squeeze box, just a waiting to be played. It's like, that doesn't work. So we can't keep him short. Yeah, and there have been times where, uh, like, Lyle and the Kindly Viking, Jerry had Jimmy's voice. (laughs) Oh, they mixed it up. Yeah, Yeah, and they didn't think to change it because they thought it was fine. Yeah, I've seen that a few times. I think one time in Sherlock Holmes, once in Lyle. Do you, oh, do you know why that happens? It's, it's, I think it happens because we the script will be wrong. Like the script was flipped, you know, so that said Jimmy, I, or it's probably me typing it wrong. I typed Jerry when I meant to type Jimmy or Jimmy when I meant to type Jerry. And so we, you know, someone catches it, but it's been recorded wrong. And then they correct it in animation because the script says one thing, but we recorded it another way. And yeah, it's. It's, every now and then I'll call Jimmy Jerry. I just get confused. Well, what's the they production? keep legally changing my name. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't like this very much. How mm. about a uh, Mr. Nezer? Which you know, on on that, it was very interesting to me when they you know tried to recast Mr. Nezer and then yeah. it just fell off. And they were like, "No, nah, we're bringing Phil back." Yeah, that well, was, that, was that was great. That was, I was TBN because DreamWorks never would have done that because DreamWorks had an official policy that you could not have a voice actor perform a character. It was so funny when I got that call. It's like, you can't be Mr. Nezer. Actually, the first call was, um, can you be Mr. Nezer, but make him white? <laughs> what? What do you mean make him white? <laughs> He's green. What do you mean? <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. DreamWorks believes you're doing a black voice. Can you do Mr. Nezer as a rich white man like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons? I was like, what? What? I'm not doing a black voice. I'm doing the Oogie Boogie Man from The Nightmare Before Christmas. They said, yes, but the Oogie Boogie Man is played by a black. And I said, the Oogie Boogie Man's a bag of bugs. <laughs> He's not He's green. <laughs> He's a bag of bugs, a burlap sack. I said, yeah, but the actor is doing a type of voice that is known to be a, a black stylization. I'm like, oh, this is ridiculous. I don't usually like say, oh, the political correctness is out of hand. But this, like, <laughs> no, that's too I, much. I can't be Mr. Nezer. So then they, you know, said we're going to take with TBN. They said we're going to take the opportunity to try to cast, you know, someone famous who's African American that has a or just someone who has a social media following because that always works. That's what we want for guest voices now: people with big social media followings, so they can help promote the show. It's like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, so then Mr. Nezer walks out and he's like, <laughs> like, wow, that's really an aggressive African-American voice. <laughs> you didn't even try to find someone who sounds like Mr. Nezer. <laughs> ho, 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 it's time for the show. Curtain in 10 seconds. Ho, 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 it's time for the show. Curtain's up in 10 seconds. It was, it was like, you know, Eddie Murphy doing the dragon from Milan. It was like, <laughs> I'm making waffles. It's like, I don't know if. Is that really? You don't think anyone's going to notice that? And then, you know, and then like five shows later, they call me back and say, uh, he's not available. Could you, could you do the Mr. Nezer again? Like, do I have to imitate him or do I do Mr. <laughs> Nezer? It's so weird. And and DreamWorks wanted to kill Mr. Lunt, too, because he was obviously Latino. Oh, they wanted to get rid of him completely? Completely! No. They wanted to kill him. No. And, no, and there no, was I'm getting a, mad. There was a minor uprising in defense. I don't know on what grounds. If I can't, you know, be Mr. Nezer, I'm not sure why I can be Mr. Lunt. But it was like, okay, you can still do Mr. Lunt, but we're taking away his gold tooth. 
Like, well, that is solved. Now we have world peace. Yeah, it's been not... now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the best character. You can't get rid of him. You'll know. You get rid of his tea. <laughs> That's the thing about Mr. Nether. I'm sorry, Mr. Lot. I can't even, I don't even know who I am. When I'm talking about myself, I don't know who I am. He's the most fun to perform because he can get away with saying almost anything. And for some reason, people don't mind. I can say things that would get Bob canceled in 12 countries, but nobody cares if I say them because I'm that little crazy guy. <laughs> it's the same thing with uh, Sunday School Lady from What's in the Bible. I've, I've done some live radio interviews as Sunday School Lady, and, and I'll end up just going off on her history of, of being a missionary in Erie and Jaya and the terrible things that she did. <laughs> It's like it would be so offensive if I did it as myself. But Sunday school lady, you know, like, hello, dears. Yes, I was in the jungles of Yuri and Jaya. I gave them canned food and told them it was from Jesus. They didn't seem to know the difference. <laughs> I need to watch more what's in the Bible. I've seen Hello, dears. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, it, was, uh, it was really good. She's Minnesota. She's basically, oh, that's fantastic. But she's a 75 year old Sunday school teacher. I love that. From the yeah, but, locked locked in so the church if, basement. If you put Mr. Lunt and Sunday School Lady in the same room, like could could we even view the result of that? Like, they how are. Would... <laughs> uh, I it would be hard to write them because they're similarly kind of you know anarchic. Is that a word? <laughs> I think um, so. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, and so you need you know you need like the straight one, the anchor, and then the loose cannon. And if you put two loose cannons in a dialogue. I don't even know if they're even responding to each other. <laughs> just saying <laughs> random things. You get veggie tails in the house, right? <laughs> uh yeah. Yeah. It's just they're just running around eating sardines and burping. I think that's that's where you go. Cool. It was Thanks, really guys. great talking to you, Phil. Yeah, you too. What's oh, is your real name Nicholas? Yes. Is that your real name? Okay. No. <laughs> you don't never put your real name on anything. He's very secretive, you know? It's an internet personality. <laughs> you should I... try it sometime. I'm, Phil, it's too late. Phil Tega. It's too late for me. <laughs> it's too late. Everybody knows me, and they either love me or hate me. Well, That's you got just... you got two people who love you right here. Thanks, man! That was my interview with Phil Vischer. I'm putting a big check mark on my bucket list. <laughs> it happened, guys. Episode 120. Ultimate Unofficial VeggieTales Podcast. Stay tuned. You will get more.